Shall we start? Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Um, how's the food? Good? Are you sleepy? I am. <laughs> and what I did is, so my job is to keep you awake. So I did a couple of things. I had three matka ice creams. <laughs> then I then I ensured that I had a, a cup of tea and I've kept uh, enough water there actually to ensure that I'm awake and I'm not going to allow you to go to sleep. Okay. Um, quick one. Mm, it's a nice small gathering. So I'm going to do a, more of a chit chat and discussion so that it doesn't look like boring actually. So um, I've seen a lot of it. Um, in my previous avatar, I was the, uh, you know, the head of Gartner in India. Gartner does a lot of uh, conferences, large ones. And they were the, they are actually the largest conference company in the world. And um, one of the things we learned was how to create death by PowerPoint. Actually. So I'm not going to ensure that you die looking at the PowerPoint. So I keep it very uh, you know, full of images. The other thing I do is that um, I do a lot of interactive things. Actually. So just stay with me. A uh, lot of things I personally begin to believe is common sense. Because I believe as long as you apply common sense, I think things fall in place because the people who wrote it for first time or created the lead methodology for first time would have created out of common sense. It, it wouldn't have been an epiphany that it's a e is equal to mc square or Newton's third law. It's a very simple thing. They would have observed and say, oh, wow, that doesn't make sense. <clears throat> uh, before I get into it, I just want to understand a little bit of a demographic here. So stay with me and just help me understand um, who you are. You don't have to introduce yourself because it'll take a long time. Uh, but just raise your hand. How many of you are entrepreneurs here? Okay, one, two, three, four. Good to hear that. Uh, how many of you, come on in, it's okay. Don't get scared, there is a seat here. Right? There is an award for people who are sitting next to me actually at the end of that. You can come here. Uh, how many of you are, uh, I'm assuming your bosses are not around, how many of you are planning to start a venture? Okay, good to hear that. Okay, so what I'm seeing is, or what I'm learning is that close to 60% either are entrepreneurs or about to become entrepreneurs. <clears throat> so whatever I share with you, I can tell you it's going to be very valuable. First, it's a global best practice. Second, we have worked with 4,000 startups globally in this time in this world. Third is, this is inversely proportional to what you have learned in your corporate. So you're gonna find it hard to crack this. Okay? Fourth is, if you don't apply, I can tell you you're gonna fail. And I don't want you to fail, because that's one of our mission, is to ensure that startups don't fail. Along the way, I'll keep talking about myself, who we are. Uh, those of you who are very savvy uh, you know, on social media, uh, I think Agile has, at Agile India, you can tweet. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Rajiv Banduni. You can include me there. And uh, if you are even more savvy, you can include Growth Enabler Twitter handle. So who is Growth Enabler? Okay, Those of you who haven't taken the time to go to the website agenda and watch my Hindi video, which uh, my friend Nitin put together and read some of the articles which has come about. Um, we started, uh, Growth Enabler is a London-based company. We have a head office in London. Uh, there are three of us who started it. We are all lefts. Gartner are based out of India. I've got another partner called Arthur Blehotra, uh, he's based out of London. And then we've got a third partner called Lars Lynn Wellebeck, and he's a Danish guy based out of Copenhagen. Because wherever we are, there are obviously three offices. So we are international from day one. And we have office, uh, presence in Hong Kong, presence in uh, Palo Alto. <clears throat> Why did we create for a very simple reason? We want to do three things. We want to ensure that anyone who wants to become an entrepreneur should have a very easy access to tools, templates, and access to funding in a way that it looks democratic. So we are trying to build a paradigm way the world leading advisors deliver to you. Why do we think we need to do it? For a very simple reason. Uh, take your time to go through it, actually. But I'll tell you what happened. <clears throat> this is not the way we wanted to start it. We got compelled because we saw a problem. And I can tell you, every startup is born like this. We started something called WK Knight. We said, there are three of us, we have earned, we'll be able to do some bit of angel funding, we're gonna pick up six, seven companies, work with them, invest in them, take them global, we have a, you know, I understand India, US, my partner understand entire India market, the other guy understands Scandi and China, so we'll go after ICE market, India, China, and New York and those. In our quest to find out that six, seven startups, we begin to realize 
is a huge problem. The problem is that there are more than seven startups who need to become successful. The problem is that while the startup is a poster boy in India, in Bangalore, in the rest of the world, there are only 0.1% of poster boys. 99.9% .9 of guys, they actually fail. They go nowhere. Okay. I mean, in fact, if you look at a global study done by likes of uh, Forbes, they said 85% of the startup fail in first 18 months. They actually shut down. And then they found out what they realized in first 12 to 14 months. Okay. By the time they run out of money, the runway is over, they're dead. <clears throat> That led us to believe is that what's going on? Because how big is this problem? Man? If 85% are there, so why why it's happening? To our surprise, we realized is that the startup world is huge contrary to what you see in this here. I mean, on an average in India from last four five years, 100,000 new companies have been registered. In China last year, 1.9 million new companies registered. In UK, which has a population of 67 million, more than half a million companies registered. There's something wrong in India. It's going to touch a million. The challenge is, um, with just around 200 accelerators, how do you serve the needs of everyone? And guess what if you don't live in Bangalore? Guess what if you don't get access to accelerator, somebody is smarter than you gets into that, how are you going to build your startup? That led us to believe that there has to be a way that entire startup building has to be democratized. It should be accessible to anyone. So most of our modules are available um, you know, to most of the people. It's free of cost. Um, the other thing we do is that you don't have to come to us. It's available on web. Just have a look at it. These are all the videos, tools, templates. I promise you at the end of this session, I'm going to give you a tool which you can use it. These are simple checklists which you can use before you launch a product or planning to launch a product. And finally, what we realized is that all these people need access to global coaches who are who either have done it or know how to do it. So we have around close to 30 global coaches across the globe. These are either the board member of Fortune 500 companies or they are ex-founders who have money, they are interested in investing or they are interested in coaching. Then by virtue of what happened was a lot of uh, people who wants to be part of ecosystem in India started talking to us. One thing led to another and as what has happened is that in last 11 months, we launched only 11 months back, now there are corporates talking to us likes of um, big fives, likes of big pharmaceutical companies that how do we access this innovation? So we feed them innovation. So if you're building a B2B startup, you're building something, uh, they are the people that are interested in knowing that because we have known them. We know most of the CIOs. Actually. So we're testing that product right now, and we have close to four beta in that in London. Actually. So this is a bit about us. Actually. Let me just <clears throat> quickly just talk about simple thing. Actually, One thing we learned was the entire structure of startup advice doesn't exist. Like I'm talking about something I'm going to share, and then I'm going to leave. And even if you found a better way of launch a product, how do you raise capital? How do you hire people? There has to be a structure. Like there is a curriculum in everything, there has to be a structure. A company building, a startup building needs to happen. What we started creating, simple thing, is that everyone needs to take a decision. Okay. To take that decision, they need five things. Competence, capability, uh, communication, clarity of purpose, and confidence. This is the only way that can be built when you know what you're doing and what is going to be the outcome and how to go about it. We started calling them key decision matrix. Go to any decision, go to our website, you press any of them, you're going to get all that advice. Actually, It's available on web, toolkits are available, download. Now we are rehashing website, we are creating assessment tools where you can assess where do you stand. Actually. All that is free to you use it actually, so that you can get step-by-step -step advice. You don't have to come to me, it's all available on website. You can go anywhere and do that. Actually. Today we're going to focus on creating amazing product. We deliberately kept, we didn't keep it lean or something, although we are a big believer of lean, but it's amazing product. You can create amazing products with or without lean. Actually. But there is a reason why I feel lean philosophy, because I personally feel is that that's the only way a startup can be successful. There's no other way I've seen it. We have followed it. We are a big believer of that. And we know there are so many companies who work with us have followed it. Actually. And there are some companies who are now at a stage where we are working with them to raise you know, close to a million pound, actually, so around uh, uh, 10 crore rupees and other things. There are companies in India we are trying to raise the half million uh, dollar for them. When we see various, we're helping them to get through that. Actually. So we have seen that success, how it needs to be done. Okay. <clears throat> now that the room is full and good, uh, how's the food? Those guys who came late, actually, I think you were busy ensuring that it's there. 
all good with you guys? Okay, cool. Thank you. Appreciate. Okay, three things I'm gonna do. Uh, what we're gonna share? Assumption. Every startup starts with an assumption, saying that there is a problem I can solve it, and then we go and execute an assumption, and then we do a little bit of premature scaling. Heard of a company called Tiny Owl? Yeah, Tiny Owl, it's a food delivery company. A lot happening there, actually, looks like. A little bit of premature scaling. We're gonna talk, we're gonna talk a lot about India, actually, because we have collected a lot of data here. <clears throat> if you have to launch your product today, just by a show of your hand, how confident you feel that you can, you are ready to launch your product, irrespective of your startup or you're working for a company here? One, two, three, around 10% of people. Okay, I'm gonna ask again after going through this presentation that how many of you feel you'll be able to launch your product going through this presentation. Just This is my way of just understanding whether it made sense, whether you get it that these can be applied. I like feedback. I don't want to create death by PowerPoint and I also don't want to create a commu one way communication. So I'm gonna do a lot of, you know, in and out, I'm gonna reach out to you, ask you, and feel free to ask me questions. Those who have come late, uh, you can tweet about this conference at, uh, at Agile India. Uh, you can include us. Um, we are at Growth Enabler. You can include me. I'm at Rajiv Banduni. Do all those things. <clears throat> okay, so let me just focus on assumption. How many of you agree that there is an assumption and we believe that assumption is true and then we get into the market that we need to start a company. That's how I started Growth Enabler. What do you think, how did you are thinking to start that? Is there an assumption you have and then you feel that problem exists and you want to go and start a company? Yeah, everyone believes that? Okay. The problem is, it's good, but it's not enough. Because it's just an assumption. And the other thing I've learned and that's the reason I like Indian native languages because they define words very, very nicely. English has a little bit of sophistication, right? So while a lot of startups assume, a lot of guys they tell me is that we have a hypothesis. Based on that hypothesis, we are building this company. I'm okay with that. I just say that, can you just repeat that word sentence? Just replace hypothesis with one word. Yes, and then tell me with same confidence that you're building a company or a startup. I have a guess and I'm building a company. How does it sound now? Sounds scary, right? So every time you say I have a hypothesis, do me a favor, replace it with a guess, okay? So don't you think we all need to know what our customer wants? Or are we very clear that we know what our customer wants? 10 out of 10 startup I meet who are struggling to grow, go through this problem and syndrome. That's the biggest mistake they do, is that they assume that I know my customer. Because they just decide to assume that I know my customer, that's where the problem starts. <clears throat> you see, I like when I say startup is a faith-based initiative because nothing happened till the time you believe there is a problem exists, I need to solve it. But the problem is that when you decide that I need to start something, there is a problem that exists and I need to go, go and solve it, it's just a problem. If you have to build an organization that's scalable, the revenue that can be repeated, you need to go a little further. If just believing that delivering food, and let me just tell you because we have gone as back as 15, 16 years, this whole food delivery is going on since 1999, you know that. There was a company called Webvan. There was the first company who used to deliver groceries in 1999. In fact, they had an IPO, did you know that? Right, it looks very recent phenomena, isn't it? There was another company, I'm trying to recollect the name, they started delivering, have you heard of Krispy Kreme Donuts? Yeah, they said, I'm gonna deliver Krispy Kreme donuts at eight o'clock in the morning, Saturday, because people love to have different kind of breakfast. So much so, Amazon invested in that company. That also closed out. 
So there must be a reason because all these people from last 16 years are believing that I can deliver grocery and food. Not many people have made money out of that. So remember, whatever you are doing, it's a faith-based initiative. <clears throat> so first mistake, anyone, you know, and I want you to just keep in mind when you see, when you begin to believe, I know what customer wants, please don't do that. Go back home and say, if I ask the customer, is that what you want? Number two, I know there are a lot of, how many of you are software engineers here? Very good. A lot of you. Uh, you know what's waterfall method? Okay, a lot of you know what is waterfall method. <clears throat> so the first mistake leads to second mistake and I say, I know what features I need to build because I know what my customer wants because that's what I've learned in most of the large software companies, is that this is the pro software I need to create, these are the features I need to build. Tell me when the product is gonna be ready. The alpha, beta, gamma, whatever is the version, is gonna be ready 12 months from now. Nobody cares. You see that a vector in what, uh, in your, uh, what do you call, um, waterfall development, the vector has only one direction. The problem with startup is, it's actually inversely proposal. The vector there is cyclical. So if you decide to follow a waterfall method and go out and say, I know the feature and develop that feature, build an app, take six, seven months to do that and then go to the customer. Again, 10 out of 10 people have come back to me and said only one thing. Man, 99% of the feature is not relevant. Problem what happens at that time is that a lot of money has gone in and the runway has become shorter. How many of you believe that any startup, funded or non-funded, has a limited runway till the time is getting convinced that there is a ray, at, ray of hope at the end of the tunnel? I do believe. The only thing a startup should care for, how much money is left in the bank before I shut this company? And that's how you need to work, very simply. And the only way when you work like that, you can avoid pitfalls is that every time you build something, Okay, and believe this can solve a problem. Instead of building a product, take a sketched version of minimum viable product and show it to at least 400 people and say, if I build that, would you buy? I can tell you there are 20 other people will be building that or exist in the market. You need to do three things. Either it should be cheaper, it should be faster, it should be better. Those 400 people will tell you, I like it, but can you change this, 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 this? go back and change it. Then you got to ask them one more question. If I build this, would you pay? Then you got to ask them one more question. Would you pay 10,000 rupees because my build cost is 8,000 rupees? I'm going to make 20% margin. And you need to ask all these things right up front on the day you have decided to build your startup. Unless you're heading for a failed product launch. Okay, so it's important, always keep in mind, whatever you decide, whether it's an app, whether it's, it's things like what you want to uh, build. For an example, I've, I mean, I connect with a lot of startup actually, so I'll give you a very interesting example because I know a lot of people have talked about Redbus because I've interviewed quite a lot of people there. I've also interviewed, there was a company parallel to Redbus. Have you heard of that? Buswala.com. Yeah? Did you know that while Redbus was not funded, they got funding of two crore rupees? Did you know that they went ahead and gave because people were not using software to push the bus ticket, they gave them software free. Then they said, there is no computer, they gave them computer free. Then they said, there's no internet, they gave them internet free. And then they ran out of money, they never used it. The other company was planning to do same thing, did that for one and a half year, learned that it's not gonna go there. They started selling ticket at bus stand. And then suddenly they had 500 tickets. What a bus operator wanted? wanted access to that 500 ticket. He says, I can give you, where is the software? Everything got sorted out. Have you heard of a company called ID Fresh? How many of you eat dosa at home? Good. Have you used that dosa better? How many of you eat that Kerala paratha? Have you seen that green color ID? It belongs to a friend of mine called Mustafa PC. Interesting story, Google him. So, he, like you guys, he worked for Motorola, was in Ireland, came back and all that um, he's from Kerala and he, one of his cousins and all that used to have a shop. 
somebody used to supply batter there, packed in a dirty things. People used to like it because gone are those days where you're gonna soak the dal and tour dal and rice and all that, make it yours in the morning. They used to watch it. Then they realized that the volume started going, complaints started coming. I mean, they would fluff, fluff up, things were not right, there was no quality control. So 40% of batter started coming back. He says, he asked him, right? I was not interested because he had no vision. He says, how about we fix the problem? That's how ID was born. It's a 120 crore company with a market valuation of 300 crores. Why did that happen? Because they saw the problem. Do you think they solved the problem? In fact, there was a complaint that one day, somebody said there's a bomb blast in the factory. They went and saw there was actually a blast, batter was all over the place. What was happening was in a chiller, batter used to ferment and the process was continuously going on. So two day batter will go and then it can't be accommodated in that, you know, the um, where they actually, uh, in a ziplock and it'll burst. They say, I don't know what's the reason. They say, oh, we know that. We use everything ingredient, fresh and all that. They were telling people, it can't burst. And pop, it burst, actually, one of the founders. It went on his face. Not that he got hurt and all that. Then they realized there's some problem. Then they started fixing it. Then they again went into the market and realized that people like buying one kg or better. Because that's nice. It works for two days, works through that. They can work and build it. Their entire company was built only supplying dosa batter. It can be used as a dosa, it can be used as an idli. Does it make sense? There was an iterative process. They didn't spend six months just finding out how to build a good dosa batter, how to do a nice packaging and all that. Because they were not sure whether people going to buy it or not, how big is the market. Then they went to a couple of people, then they put it together, took the feedback and all that. It's an iterative process. So always, you don't know what feature you need to build, but I can tell you the people who want to buy, they know what feature needs to be built. So ask them again and again. Number three, how many of people have been, you know, I, I've now certainly gone through that. You've gone through a grind of a product launch date. Four, five. Guess what happens? We carry that mentality to our startup. He says, product has come in, I need to launch it. How many of you are bikers here? I am one. Yeah, I'm motorcycle. I'm also, I also ride cycles and all that. Because motorcycle bikers. How many of actually looking forward to a launch of a new bullet adventure, which they have specially created for Ladakh, Manali, and that kind of a trip? This one UI designer is looking at it, so he says he's going to show it to me. Now, if they are launching a bike route like that, they have studied it for five years. Because I know for sure for the last 12, 15 years, people are using bullet to travel to that region. Because, I mean, a little bit of personality, I'm an ultra runner. I run races of 100 kilometer plus. So every year, for the last two years, I'm going to Spiti Valley, I mean, that's closer to Leh Ladakh. And I do, I mean, last year I did 185 kilometers. That's at an altitude of around 4,500 meters. So you see a lot of bikers there. The current version of this thing doesn't work. If they decide to launch and have a launch date, it's okay because the amount of data they have, they've studied the motorcycle, they know what goes wrong, they can do that, right? If HLL decides to have a sachets of shampoos, they've done that study. Even if it fails, it's a, a dot in their entire, uh, what do you call, balance sheet. If you start worrying about a launch date, what is it for? Does anyone know you? On a launch day, I can tell you, except for your wife, daughter, kids, brother, sister, neighbor, eight people will download your app. Nobody else is gonna download your app. So much for your launch date. Uh, I, thanks for doing that because one of the things we have done is that we are very popular with media actually. We have been covered in last um, 11 months, 70, 80 times. And I feel it's a very good media. You see, the challenge with that kind of a thing is that you're still at a hypothesis, replace it with guess, right? So you spend a lot of money, you've created a launch date, you've hired a media, media is expensive, man. And they've created a hype, but hype for what? Suppose you create a bike like that, and you launch it with a lot of fanfare. Guess what? Three bikes are sold in the next eight months. Was it worth it? Because you don't know. You're not a bike company. 
you're a startup. Everything you're doing has never been done. At least you haven't experienced it. At least you don't know how people are going to react to it. And there is no brand called Infield behind it. There's no brand called Tata behind it. Right? I mean, even if you get featured in the front page of Economic Times, it doesn't say that you have that brand recall. I think you have to think absolutely inversely proportional to a way a big company thinks for a launch. You don't even have to worry about it. What I would do is that, figure out friends, family and all that and get them together and say, look, I'm launching it. Can you use it and give me a feedback? It comes free, man. And some people say, oh, wow, it's not a bad idea to have a look at them. Remember one thing, actually. a startup is a temporary organization. Have a look at it. It's a very popular definition. It's a temporary organization that's looking for repeatable, scalable revenue model. Till the time you achieve it, everything is of no use. Your business plan is going to fall flat. Your revenue number is going to fall flat because it's based on guess. So don't even chase them. Just keep pivoting. It's a cyclical process. Just keep pivoting. Build, launch, learn, apply. Build, launch, learn, apply. That's the thing you need to do. That's where they go wrong. Because what happens is that either they have mentors who probably is the marketing head of HLL and says, oh yeah, that's the way it needs to be learned. I know how it has been launched in HLL. The guy doesn't realize is that you remove fonts out of that or you remove HLL brand out of that and then ask, go and buy this cream. I'll give you a cream. I said, I made it. It's a natural cream. Apply on your face. Man. You'll refuse to do that. You see, where is the FDA regulation on that? Who has approved it? Nothing is going to happen to me. Yet. Because there's no credibility we have. We are a startup. We got to look for people who are going to believe in us and find those 20, 30 of them and say, look, I'll give it to you. Could you pay me? Say, yeah, not a bad idea. Let me just see what it is. Then you need to look for scale. You are a temporary organization which is continuously working for one thing. How do I find a scalable revenue, a repeatable business model? Because there is no point worrying about launch date. There is no launch date. Who cares? Except you, nobody cares in the market. Because one thing for I've learned is that when somebody comes to me and says that I have a very unique idea, would you sign an NDA? I said, please go back. I'm not interested. Because I haven't met anybody who has given me a unique idea. Because I know for sure because of the global market, if what you're building, I can tell you there are 100 companies I've spoken to, they're building the same. In fact, I have a pretty good idea. They'll be, you know, they'll probably be a, uh, 12 and 16 months ahead of you. Now you need to think is what I'm building. I'm not saying that don't build it. What I'm saying is that, remember three things, cheaper, better, faster. Unless you are doing that, even if you decide, it's not that, I mean, dosa better never existed. It existed, right? What are you doing differently? cheaper, better, faster. Same dosa launch, okay, it cost 60 rupees a kg ID. Same dosa launch failed in Chennai. You know that, why? No, because there it's available for 30 rupees a kg because the rice are subsidized there. Same market, same India. They tested that market for two months, left that. It's not relevant there. Rice are subsidized there. All these people buy subsidized rice, sell the same thing for 30 rupees a kg. That guy can't manage it. Sorry? See, wherever he goes, the manufacturing is local because they do fresh ingredients. He doesn't take that subsidized rice. It's for people. Trader takes it. That's not the right thing. Right? Most of it. I mean, in your city, if the, it is a where, doesn't matter where it's coming from, legal, illegal. If it is 30 rupees kg, would you buy my 60 rupees kg? Because I have a better packaging. No way you're going to buy that. We look for value. Culturally, we are very different. Okay. Let me just move to <clears throat> the next one. Okay. So, does it, anyone make, all make sense? Assumption? Yeah. It's a guesswork. You're looking for scalable, repeatable revenue. That's the only truth. There is no truth in the number which you are talking about. In fact, anybody who builds a business plan, uh, business plan, please don't do it. There is something called business model canvas. How many of you have heard about business model canvas? One, two, three, four. Those who have not heard, please go back and uh, Google business model canvas, nicely available. If you don't have time, go to our website. There is a business model canvas. Uh, my partner Lars has put together how it needs to be built. There is an entire video. Download it. It's available free. Just fill it up. It just talks about two things. Who are your custodian? Whom you're going to sell to? Period. It's not complicated. And that's the way you need to look at it. Now, P 
people have assumed they need to build a company they believe they know the feature they believe people going to buy that they're going to solve world they're going to solve world hunger problem right that's the way they're looking at it next thing what they do is that they start executing on those assumptions and that's another flaw people have when you start executing on assumptions i kept saying that it's a hypothesis replace that it's a guess you can't execute on guess you have to was validate that whether its guess is worth betting or not who has gone out and tested the hypothesis who has believed that the hypothesis is true it can be scaled and if you haven't done it don't even worry about your execution it's not worth it. don't even take an attempt to just go out and say i need to hire designer i need to hire sales guys i need to hire that no you are the designer you are the sales guys and your co-founder is going to do everything i remember initially when we launched growth enabler we did a lot of you know the uh, uh, what you call workshops and uh, focus groups and all that because we wanted to know what the problem is we wanted to test it out we printed few banners we knew a friend and all that we used to go there 45 minutes in advance we'll ask somebody can you give us the venue we'll pull up everything and all that we'll put together we will also sit down take everyone's address name and all that we said this is what it is these are the trying to do would you buy would you pay would you continue to do that if not us how you're trying to solve this problem we went to 400 people to ask that and the reason i believe is that that's the only way i have found to build it because i couldn't have used my earlier brand name because nobody recognizes me raji bandhani with growth enabler is no brand Raji Bandhani with other Fortune 500 company was a brand because I was the head of that company. It makes sense people can talk to me. But they're not buying my product. I'm solving a different problem. I'm solving a something which people have tried, but nobody has been able to scale it. Actually, the biggest thing they have tried in an accelerator incubator is that expand it to 30 people, 40 people, and a six-month batch, and they go out. Then they don't know what happens to them. I'm saying that every part of the cycle, I'm going to be there. And guess what? I'm going to democratize it. I know startup doesn't have money. so i'm going to subsidize it to a point where it doesn't pinch you and then i'm going to use that knowledge and reach out to the people globally who are looking for innovation marry the two of them together it's a good model i tested that i tested that i knew this model i've come from that background i know how to create research with so much of thing we still sometime at the middle of the night will say is this going to go anywhere 11 months back we didn't know that there are 4000 startup will be interacting with us we didn't know that people will start funding us we didn't know that people will start buying from us we didn't know that we'll have a four beta cios in london who will say yeah i need access to that we just had a guess we kept iterating on that guess never forget one thing build measure learn and then go back the same thing whatever you have learned apply that no business plan ever met the expectation first thing what happens when you have a business plan when it goes to the market it falls so don't even try to follow a business plan for god's sake don't even put any numbers that in october you're going to have 400 people who're going to be doing if it happens good because you don't know so don't put that and create a pressure and if you have people if you have people who are you know funding you asking you that question then there is something wrong again i just say that you know eventually as the system grows become mature they they're not going to be issue with money people will give you money the problem will be whom are you taking that money from and i'm now beginning to feel horror stories of money because now media is chasing us hey these people are leaving that this organization is not working how many of you know about housing.com yeah it became a saga like a television soap just everything can go wrong went wrong in that company nobody is wrong okay neither the guys who started it nor who funded it actually i don't think people wanted to fail there it's just the maturity of startup system and the expectation and what do you build and at the end of a day as a founder if you are left with 2% of the equity do you think it's your company i don't think we have raised our first round we still own 95% of our company and we are very clear we are never going to dilute below 51% because we care for this much mission when i talk to people they connect with me most of the people who have joined us has joined us for one reason if they have known us they have attended our you know these kind of seminar 
uh, they've seen us, they've read our article, they've seen us on television. He says, I like you guys, can I work with you? And I especially invited Ankit, he's joined us uh, a week back. He's from uh, Wipro, he's um, IIT Dhanbad, uh, yeah? Read one of our article in Mint about startup. He's been uh, you know, working in startup the last two months, two years, helps startup, does the research and all that. He says, I like it, I want to play in startup. I am, uh, you know, I like researcher. We need a researcher because a lot of newspaper ask for the trends, analysis and that. He says, okay, come over. He didn't come growth enabler as a brand. He just felt that we are doing something good. This is how it has come about. I took him through the mission because that's how it connects. Unless only you care for that mission. Only you care for that problem. Nobody else cares for that. So don't even expect somebody who has funded you care for your mission. You know what do they care for? When you're going to exit and how you're going to make a 10x return to them. That's the only thing they worry about. So think 20 times when you're going to people and what they're going to ask for. Okay? You cannot continuously relentless execute and expect that your business is going to succeed without even knowing that if anybody needs that. Okay? So always focus on proving your hypothesis, not on your execution. Are you following a traditional business plan? Every time I meet a startup and say, look, I'm going to pitch to somebody. I said, yeah, go ahead. He says, here is the business plan. In month one, I'm going to do this revenue. Month two, I'm going to do this revenue. Month three, I'm going to do this revenue. I said, okay, thank you very much. Can you tell me past three months, what has been the statistics of your revenue? I said, no, we haven't done it. He says, oh, so what makes you think that month one is going to be like that? He says, no, I think so. He says, you think so? There are customers saying that I'm going to give you this much of it. Because if a known company predicts something, they have a cycle and it goes through cycle after cycle. You have no cycle. You don't even know who's gonna buy. In fact, you don't even know whether people are gonna at all buy your product. And if they do, are they gonna buy the version you have created? And if they decide to buy version that created, are they gonna buy the price you have put together? And if you have put together a price you put together, are you gonna make money? Unless you have answers to all those things, there's no point creating a business plan. That's the reason I say shift to business model canvas. That has been specially created for startup. It doesn't talk about numbers. It talks about an ecosystem of startup. Because remember, you are in a constant flow of only one thing. You are searching for repeatable and scalable business model. That's the only thing you're doing. And unless you're continuously asking yourself and you're surrounding people with those kind of, kind of questions, there is a struggle. And I think that's the problem which is beginning. I mean, look, a value-based system, the entire Forbes report was for a value-based system. It's a, they are in their third cycle of startup. We are in just first cycle of startup. Or you say one and a half cycle of startup because the first one happened when Infosys, Wipro, these guys came and put it together. After that, nothing much has happened. There was a small blip when the dot-com company happened that. We, I started a company then at that time. It was Islandis Technology. It, I mean, we were valued around $15 million. I raised around $1 million. We still exist. We have around 250 people. Uh, I have a 5% equity in that. That was a service-based economy. How many of companies you remember from that time we started as a Sadi.com, this dot-com and all that are still there and making money? At that time was like, I put together a website and, we, and people are gonna buy. That's what WebBand did. Interestingly, they created a company which will deliver groceries, 1999. Okay, then they reached out and raised fund. Everyone believed internet economy was coming. They raised, then they reached out to people. Okay, at that time they used to deliver 800 supplies every day. Nobody checked that 70% of them are repeat. 30% was dropping every day. And guess what they did? They did a $40 million contract to create a warehouse in some 14 states where they're going to deliver without knowing then they hired a VP of sales, VP of execution, VP of marketing. Nobody was interested in asking that look from 800 how we go to 2000 and those guys are planning that in two months we're going to deliver 2000. It never went. Because hype was selling then they got publicly listed and exactly seven months from getting publicly listed, they filed for chapter 11. Because nobody tested the hypothesis and the guess that it's a viable model. Not that similar model failed. Have you heard of a company called Tesco? Teapot, 
they exactly do the same thing. Tesco is a half a billion dollar grocery delivery company. They looked at the model, they understood what needs to be done. We need to keep pivoting. We need to create a cyclical model. Because what happens is that when you follow a traditional business plan, there is no trial and error. You know, you just don't go back. You try error, try error, keep applying, keep learning and put it back. Unless you do that, you're struggling. Unless you do that, there is no learning happening. This is what happens when you follow a waterfall method of developing and creating an app. So you don't know what people are going to buy. There is a book called, I'm reading it, it's a very interesting book. Somebody has written it. It's because, you know, this entire internet-based economy and a mobile-based economy, what it has done is that it has created a lot of distraction. So here is, you know, for so much for your mobile-based economy, people select, take a call to spend more time on a website and they decide that in 50 milliseconds. In 50 milliseconds, they look at a website and say, I'm going to invest time or not. One. And they decide that not based on the content, just purely based on the content. That's the recent research. It's purely based on the color. If there is so much of distraction where in 50 milliseconds people decide whether I want to invest time on that website, and purely based on color, it's how you know, our brain is like. It's a very lazy thing. I read a lot, so I connect all these dots, actually. So I have my own library. So there is a gentleman called Daniel Kahneman. How, how many have heard about him? OK, cool. Have you, heard, have you read a book called uh, Slow Mind, Fast Mind? Think, thinking Fast and Slow, yeah? It's the book normally referred to people who are doing uh, PhD in uh, uh, behavioral analytics. OK, if you're not, just have a look at them. So there is something called lazy mind, which does thinking fast. Violence gets created. They're like, oh, like red color. OK, go on that. That's the reason we've kept a red color. OK, they say, oh, like it. Red color, that's good. Let's just look at them. What do they do? It's as simple as that, because we are so distracted. People don't have time to read. If you create a website which is full of blogs, people don't have time. They like bite-sized information. The reason why Facebook has gone into videos is primarily because they realize nobody is reading it. They're either watching pictures or they are only interested in going through the videos. Nobody has time to read text, right? Has anybody thought about that when you're launching? Anything what you're doing, this is the way things are changing. Surround yourself with people who will ask you these questions or ask somebody to help you asking these questions. Because remember, the reason people fail in first 18 months is not because they don't know what to do. It's because they believe they know what needs to be done. And by the time they figure it out, it's too late. It's 14, 15 months, there's not a chance. The limit is one paycheck. Only thing you need to worry is if how much of cash I have in my bank. So traditional business versus startup needs. <clears throat> in traditional business, what happens is you basically have numbers and you measure yourself against those numbers. Startup can't do that. There is no predictability about startup. So you need to look at small, small things. For a very simple thing is don't create a measurement matrix of number create a measurement matrix initially that I've created a product. Let me just reach out to 100 people and ask them what do they think. And if the 90% of say that I don't like these features, go back and change a feature. First thing you need to fix is that, have you done enough for people to like the product the way it is? Then ask them, would you like to pay? I can tell you 20% of them may agree that, yeah, I want to pay that. Those are your first evangelists. Take care of them. They like you. They trust you. They're buying from you. Take their feedback seriously. Ask them, why are you buying from me? What do you like about me? Use that as your USP. Apply that as a learning into your product. Those are your milestones, not how many downloads you have, because it really doesn't matter. The average age of download versus deletion is so fast that in 30 minutes, people decide, I need to get out of that. In fact, I'm actually intrigued now if that people need 100 apps to access information I don't think I can do that. I've started deleting all the apps from my web. If I need to search anything, I like actually Google search, search it, have a look at it and do that because I can't go through 20 apps. I just use two, three apps which I need to use it. One is my banking, another one is my taxi app. Okay, third thing is my email app. That's it, I'm not interested because I need that. Rest, I don't do it. 
Because I realized one day I just sat, I said, look, I have 150 apps. I don't use 90% of them. And those are like big companies. If the app exists in you, you have known them. If I don't use them, guess what? If you have created an app, what are the chances that I'm going to download it? I'm going to discover it. And guess what? What are the chances I'm going to use it? And all these things doesn't happen. How are you going to make money out of this? Wow. The room is full now. That's good. Welcome, guys. Feels good. <clears throat> so never, no product launches measurement. Never try to do that. A lot of people do that mistake. Don't focus on your revenue. You have no predictability about revenue. The only thing you have predictability about is you're testing, I know something, are people going to buy those things? I know something, people like it. I know something, people say, you know what, 80% it looks good, 20% if you change it, it's going to make sense to me. Those are the measurement. Anything, if anybody tells you the measurement about your revenue, is basically fooling you. Five minutes? Okay, good. Finally, premature scaling. Are we out of time? Only five minutes. Oh, is it? Can you give me five minutes? Okay. Thank you. Ah, thank you. <clears throat> okay, premature. So what happens is that you've gone through one assumption to execution on assumption. Now comes the premature scaling. Why do you think in last three months, 90% of people who have been fired are from the companies who are into food delivery? Because all of them, yeah, what do you think what went wrong? So true, so true, right? Because the assumption, and then assumption, and then execution and assumption, and then scaling on assumption, that's what Web1 did. You see, you are not at execution stage then. So when you hire people, don't hire people who are in execution mode. In fact, there is no department call for you execution. There is no department called marketing for you. There is no department called sales for you. The only department is called uncertainty. I'm going, I'm trying to test something. If something works, I'll go back, fix it, and I'll create more of it. I tell everybody as an as a entrepreneur, ensure that you have made friends with uncertainty because every day is an uncertain. If you take 10 steps forward, I can give you in writing, you're going to take 9 steps backward. And when that kind of uncertainty you are living it, how can you create a certain uncertainty of revenue, scaling? Except for six metros, nobody is realizing people are using taxis for sharing, people are using uh, you know food deliveries, because it does, the culture doesn't exist. Not many people go out. That's the reason food, food delivery is just going out of the window. Okay. The reason for premature scaling, again, I'll give you a web van example or that uh, buswala.com example was that because people were so focused about executing a hypothesis, which was a guess, which nobody proved it, nobody took a feedback, it only does it that there are only two kind of things happen. You hire a lot of people, you burn a lot of cash, and returns are nil. So when you run out of cash, then you get rid of people then you shut down company because you have no cash left. Any business plan you make, I can tell you that the first attempt the business plan makes with the market is going to go fall flat. It has no relevance till the time you approve your hypothesis. That's the reason very minuscule companies actually see light at the end of the day. And that's the only way you need to do that. And finally, that's what you see. Management by crisis, fire your VP of sales, fire 70% of your staff, suddenly you realize that out of nine cities, I'm going to only operate in two cities. That's it. I'm going to look at the model. Man, I wish you could have done it 20 months back. Only worked on two cities. Only tested the model there. Baked the model. Then gone into the next city. Then gone into the next city. Then done the research about this. Then made it work. For 16 years, not many people have seen who have made money delivering the food. And also keep in mind, unlike, unlike big companies where failures are seen, you know, like you're done, you're fired, you haven't done a good job. In startup, failure is every day. You need to embrace failure. Every time you do something, you're going to fail. You're going to learn, apply that. Till the time you found a method that you're going to be successful. So don't take it hard. 
In last 11 months, we have failed many times than we have succeeded. For 20 things we have done, only two things have worked. But it's part of light, it's part of lean, because you're learning, you're applying, and all those things, and that's the way it works. In the end, that's the last slide, from my point of view. It's a simple slide, you can click it, what you need to do, actually. What I've done is that, as a startup, you are in this mode, customer discovery, okay? You do customer validation, you pivot. You do customer validation, you pivot. Don't even look at customer creation and company building. It takes good 18 months just to give you on that side. And this is a very simple lean philosophy is that you have a hypothesis, you do, you try things, and then you go to phase three, then you verify, pivot, and go back. And remember, I've kept it cyclical. The vector is not in one direction. The vector is a cyclical vector. Let me finish it quickly. Now that you have gone through this, how many feel confident that they have learned a little bit about that they can launch their product? That's good. At least two more hands were raised. Okay, if you feel that you are scared, um, no question answers because we don't have time. If you feel that you are scared and you need to know what, what is required, I've created a checklist. It's a, um, you know, 10 or 12 questions of checklist before you do a product launch. Uh, I mean, you won't be able to read it. Just send me an email, just tweet me, and I'll be able to send you the link for you to download actually at info at growthenabler.com or at, uh, at Rajiv Bandani Twitter. Just send it to us. Happy to send you the checklist. Do that. You can use it. You can use it for our, your companies also. I'm done with this. Thanks a lot. Sorry I took five minutes more. Appreciate that.